All right, so thank you for the introduction. Um, so indeed, my name is Hugo Arts. I'm from, um, I'm from Boston. Um, so my background is in, tra is in engineering. So I'm trained in the Netherlands in engineering at Eindhoven, which is an engineering school. And um, afterwards, so that was in biomedical engineering and um, um, uh, artificial intelligence. And afterwards, I did a PhD in, uh, in, in image analysis. And then I came to Boston, so I did this in, in the Netherlands. And then I came to Boston to, um, to do a, PhD, a postdoc in, in uh, computational biology, so completely something else. So what I'm doing now is I try to integrate both expertises into one. So what we're doing is we apply a lot of mathematical algorithms to medical imaging data and see then also how this relates to other data sources. So in this presentation, and of course I had to change the title, but in this presentation I want to focus on how radiomics can, um, uh, what, how, what the role uh, can be played for, the, for imaging in precision medicine. So I think indeed, also as has been uh, described before, is that there's a lot of methods and a lot of tools that have been developed by the CAD community that can be used in a very similar manner uh, to other problems that we have in cancer research. Um, so I'm going to disclose information. So I'm a consultant and shareholder for uh, Genospace. Um, and I have grant support from mainly actually the NCAI and also from other funding sources. So in this presentation, I want to uh, have three main objectives. So 45 minutes, so I think three is uh, very reasonable. Uh, first, I want to describe the motivation for computational imaging. So why do we want to do this? Um, and also the, uh, about radiomics. Uh, second, I want to describe uh, the robust methodology. So how do we get to robust features and radiomics data? Um, and then I want to give you some examples. So once we have this, this data, how do we link that back to genomic and to, um, uh, to clinical outcome data? So for the people not in the cancer field, I want to show you this. So we're not curing cancer now. You know, cancer is not being cured uh, despite of the genomic error. And this is a big statement. And of course, you know, with the, 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 the new advances in immunotherapy and targeted therapies, um, it's improving. But overall, cancer is a very, very difficult disease to tackle. And one of the most important things is intratumor heterogeneity. So a tumor is not a homogeneous bulk of, uh, of cells. It's a very heterogeneous disease. So one of the key papers in this field um, has been published by uh, Charlie Swanson's group from UCL in London. And what he did is they look at um, RCC, which is renal cell carcinoma. They took the tumor out and they sequence different areas within the tumor. So what they wanted to assess is that how is there any biological um, uh, heterogeneity on a you know, gene expression level, but also on a molecular level. So how different are different regions of a tumor? A very basic question, right? And what they found was really staggering. So they found that there's a lot of common mutations that occur in almost every region. So these are a lot of these driving mutations like EGFR, for example, or KRAS in lung cancer. But what they found, but also what they found is that there's a lot of very specific mutations that only occur in one or two of the different regions. So this means that if you have a target therapy that focuses on one of these very specific mutations, um, it's very likely you're only going to cure one subset of the tumor and not the to total tumor bulk. So therefore, um, what they have shown is that one of the biggest, biggest problems in, uh, in, in cancer is that we're fighting not one disease, but not one amnemia, but we're fighting often um, 20 or 30 different subclones within that tumor that are also dynamic even over time. So the mutations that they have now can be completely different from the mutation pattern that they have later, or at least it's an evolutionary process. So the, what I also really liked about it, what they did as well, is that they looked at the gene expression patterns of each of these uh, samples. And so there's a lot of uh, prognostic gene signatures. So that, you, know, you take a biopsy from a tumor, then you uh, assess the genes, and you want to see you know, how prognostic, how, is this patient going to die or not, right? And what they showed is that where your sample within this tumor can be completely different, uh, the pattern of the gene expression data, data can be completely different, but it can even be reversed. So meaning that if you sample one area, you know, this patient would have a very bad survival. If you sample the other area, it will, the patient will be having a very predictive, um, so it will be predicted that it will have a very uh, good survival. So this really shows the limit of biopsy-based assays. So it's, it, there's a lot of heterogeneity, and there's a lot of very specific biological events uh, occurring only in subclones of the total tumor. So 
imaging for precision medicine. So of course, imaging has a lot of advantages here, right? So it's performed non-invasively, you know, so we don't have to go in and you know, have a risk and a burden to the patient. Um, there's maybe some radiation dose, but at least it's not invasive. Um, but also, the nice thing is it provides a full 3D picture of the cancer, right? So we can really quantify the complete phenotype on the cancer by, uh, on imaging. And the nice thing is also is that it's already performed in clinical practice. So we have a lot of data before, during, and after treatments where we can really capture a cancer's appearance and a phenotype before treatments, during treatment, and after treatment. So we can really see its evolution. Um, and also the nice thing is that this data is already available, right? So we can, there's a, for a lot of patients, you know, we have, you know, say 10 scans, for example, uh, before, during, and after. So we can really already assess this in, uh, in clinical practice. Of course, there is also a lot of disadvantages. You know, we, you don't probe the cancer at a microscopic level, but at a microscopic level, right? So we're not looking, you know, we maybe don't have the, the, the resolution that we want to. Although, you know, we, uh, I'll, I'll, it also probes, so it probes the cancer at a microscopic level, right? So, but it also is very qualitative and not quantitative, meaning that um, it's, you know, the exact voxel values within one scan are difficult to compare between one and the other. But, so this makes it difficult if you have one tumor versus the other to compare these values. And the, um, uh, but also, even if you have the same tumor imaged twice over time, these images can also be different. Um, so the, one of the most important slides I want to show you is this one. Uh, what you can see here are six uh, tumors, uh, lung cancer tumors. And you can see uh, the, also the CT scans. So CT scans are you know, like an old-fashioned workhorse in ecology, to say it like that. Uh, it's performed very often in almost every cancer center in the world. So what you can see now is that there's a lot of phenotypic traits that exist on these imaging, right? So using very conventional CT imaging, we can already quantify a lot of these phenotypic traits. So some tumors are very homogeneous, other ones are very heterogeneous, some are very round and isolated, other ones are more uh, infiltrated and spiky. So what we try to do now is we try to quantify these traits in a very uh, robust manner. And please remember that in the clinic, uh, only a maximum diameter measure is used. So they use a, a, a single line or two, di uh, two directions, a maximum diameter. So they say tumors five centimeters or six centimeters. So what we try to do is we try to quantify a lot of this data um, using uh, this radiomics approach. So why do we do this? So, you know, like we try to integrate imaging genomic data. So, you know, you have a lot of data um, from, um, from different hierarchical levels. So you have anatomic, anatomical imaging, which is the T imaging, all the way down to genomic uh, imaging in the bottom. So what we try to do is we try to uh, change this 3D imaging cube into radiomics data that we then, um, into quantitative data that we then can compare to uh, genomic data and to clinical outcome data. So this is one of the main uh, research areas that I'm very interested in. So how are there different biological patterns that drive a different phenotype that we can, and can quantify you to, using radiomics, but also, most importantly, how is that associated with clinical outcomes? So can, you know, is it also useful in the clinic? Um, there are two studies um, that I want to show you that, were, uh, that really set the scene in this whole uh, uh, field. Um, and the first one is published by Aaron Segal in Nature Biotech in 2007. And what he did is, um, uh, was a very nice study. So he, what they did is they quantified uh, a number of traits in liver cancer, which were manually scored by expert radiologists, right? So internal arteries, you know, zero to five, or textural heterogeneity, high, low. So there was a lot of, you know, these trained experts, they looked at these images, um, and they quantified different traits. And then they had um, um, a technique where they also linked this back to, uh, to the gene expression clusters. Uh, what they found is, uh, what they presented is that, you know, using a limited number of traits, and I'm, I think it's like 25 or something like that, they could explain up to 85% of the genetic heterogeneity, so the, the gene expression heterogeneity in these samples. So they showed there was a correlation between the imaging data and the phenotype data and also the underlying driving biology. Um, there was also a lot of things that were, you know, so there was a very small data set with only 28 samples for training, uh, only 19 for validation, so it's very heavily underpowered. But I think they really, you know, demonstrated uh, for the first time this association. Um, so from the same group, um, they um, studied, also presented a study in 2008, so a year later in uh, PNES, where they did a similar thing with brain cancer. So in uh, GBMs, they, so uh, gliobastomas, they looked at different uh, phenotypic traits quantified by radiologies, like contrast enhancement, high, low. 
uh, mass effect, for example, high-low. And then what they did is they linked this back to the different gene expression patterns, and they found significant correlations uh, with uh, uh, gene sets like EGFR overexpression, hypoxia, and proliferation. So all gene sets that are very important in tumor development and uh, uh, therapy resistance. So they, again, and they had a nicer data set, so only two, 22 for, for training, but they had at least 110 for validation. So the statistics was also better on this. So what we tried to do is we tried to build on this, right? So that's why we started this several years ago. Uh, we wanted to go into radiomics. Um, and so what, what it involves is to extraction of quantitative and automated features uh, from images and producing useful data elements. So how can we turn an image, a 3D imaging cube, into useful data? Um, and also what we try to aim is, we try to aim to, provi to uh, provide an as comprehensive as possible quantification of the phenotype of the tumor. So we have uh, a large number of imaging features, a lot of redundancies, so a lot of very similar features, but we try to be as comprehensive as possible to quantify this. Um, there are several steps in this whole process. Um, um, simply said, it's not always the case how it is presented here, but I think you know, it, it's a very sequential process. So you take an image, um, you perform a segmentation where uh, you have to identify a region of interest, you do a feature extraction, so you quantify these features, these phenotypic traits, and then you do an analysis. And this analysis is very similar to a bioinformatics analysis. Um, of course, each of these also has its challenges, each of these steps, so uh, the image acquisition, for example, matters, you know, how do you take that image, you know, if it's different between one patient and the other, the field of view, resolution, all these different things, for example. Uh, so reconstruction things matter, of course, standardization, storage even, you know, we, we store reconstructed images, not the raw data. Um, so there's a lot of different aspects that really matter, the, uh, how good we can compare one image to the other and uh, for these kind of purposes. Uh, but also, um, we, uh, we look at segmentation, right? Because segmentations have to be automated, have to be validated, have to be robust and reproducible. And we do this, we, you know, we try to automate this process as much as possible. And we do this because for retrospective analyses, for example, where we have hundreds of samples, it's often very difficult to, uh, to go back and have manual segmentation performed for all of them. It takes a long time. But also we want to use these methods to reduce the intra and inter-observed variability that we know that is uh, existing. You know, if you have similar radiologists delineating the same, uh, same tumor, we have different results. Even if the same radiologist does it twice, we also have different results. So, uh, we are also doing this now within 3D Slicer, so I'm also Brigham, so you know, I have to do it in 3D Slicer, but I really like it. Um, so we are uh, looking at different uh, algorithms for the fast and automated and semi-automated uh, uh, target definition. So we want to have tools that are completely automated, but also that can be done before a radiologist sees it the scan, but also we want to have tools that if a radiologist goes in, you know, it's very interoperable, it's very fast, uh, it works with the user to, to get to uh, a stable end results as quick as possible. So the nice thing is, is that um, one uh, thing, one study what we did is we use a region growing algorithm and, uh, you know, using these semi-automatic approaches, you can really see that, you know, at the top you can see the 3D slicer, uh, 3D segmentation, uh, semi-automatic segmentation, sorry, algorithm. I can really see that, you know, it, it's able to capture these very fine extensions of a tumor uh, because it works in a 3D manner, not in a 2D. And if you look at manual, you can see that you have really the slice by slice effect because you're segmenting, you know, a user is always uh, segmenting. It's mostly slide by slide. So um, there's, of, co of course, other advanced, more, more advanced algorithms, but I just want to show you that these things really matter. So if we look at um, the feature, so once we have an image, we have a segmentation, we want to extract and uh, inform the features, uh, we have to define them, see which ones are out there, um, look at reproducibility, robustness, all of these different aspects. Um, so Without going too much in detail, because I think it's the feature sets are very similar to, uh, for, for the CAT community. Um, you know, we capture specifics like, you know, like shape-based um, differences, like, like sphericity or roundness and all, but also more advanced uh, features, like looking at the frequencies on the surface of the tumor. Um, <clears throat> the biggest group is actually textual features, where we look at, uh, which are really developed by, uh, by the, the AI field and the computer vision field, where we look at um, uh, the similarities between adjacent voxels and, and, uh, and, um, and differences between adjacent voxels. Uh, but also even first order statistics, you know, like even entropy or range can often be very, can be seen to be very important for, um, for it can be a very important feature that we can use uh, later on. Then, 
um, what we also do is we have this original image, we apl apply different filterings uh, using, for example, Laplacian of Gaussian or wavelets, and then we, you know, we focus uh, on a different frequency domain, for example, in, the, in an image, and then again we can extract different features. And what we see is, is that using these filter techniques, we have the most optimal performance, likely because we can, for example, remove noise effects, uh, but also, um, um, so, but also because these filter methods, you know, have specifics in them for, 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 for assessing specific phenotypic traits. So all in all, uh, we have now uh, 1,600 different features in the current release. A lot of them are very redundant, but also a lot of them are very informative. So once we have all these features, how do we make sense of them, right? So what we need to do is we have to define a robust analysis. So we have to look at feature selection. We have to look at, uh, um, at machine learning. And the main reason is, is that we, we really believe that you know, for the best predictive and prognostic models um, with a high accuracy and reliability, we really need, um, we, you know, we, need to, we, need, um, we think that these are really the driving factors of the success of radiomics. So we really need machine learning tools. And we also, you know, radiomics suffers from the curse of dimensionality, right? So we have a lot of data for often a limited number of samples. How do you make sense of that? So we need a feature selection and we need to uh, look at different uh, machine learning classification methods. So what I want to show you here is a study that we did um, where we, uh, or data of uh, 422 non-sponsored lung cancer patients, so lung cancer patients, and we very simply, you know, just uh, presented a, a correlation heat map, right? So the radiomics features are horizontally and vertically are the same. So in the diagonal, you know, they have the highest correlation of one, right? They're exactly the same. But what you can immediately spot here is that there's a lot of very uh, uh, light red and light green to say like that. So there's a lot of very highly correlated features. So there's a lot of redundancy in this data. So we have to reduce this data. Um, we have to, you know, we have to reduce this dimensionality to, to, to drive, to really drill down to the most informative features. So one thing, what is really good about imaging, and which is often very difficult, for example, in the genomic uh, domain, is that we can have a test retest, right? So we, could, we can take a scan, uh, and this is the rider test retest data set from, uh, from Larry Schwartz from uh, Columbia, New York. And what he did, uh, and he made this also publicly available, which is really great. Uh, and what he did is they uh, took 31 uh, patients, they put them on a CT scanner, they got off, got a coffee, I guess, because it was a coffee break test. Then they went on and got another scan 50 minutes later. So what we then have is two scans 50 minutes apart um, from the same patient, right? So we can segment both of them, then we do feature extraction for both of them, and then we want to see how similar are they, right? So by doing so, we cannot say which feature is really important, but we can really say, you know, if they're unstable, they will very likely not be informative. So we can reduce the features that are uh, going to be unstable and therefore also uh, almost impossible to be informative in future scans. Um, so by doing so, by using these kind of data sets, we can really um, um, assess feature stability in a, in a very uh, robust manner. But also is important is assessing different machine learning techniques. So in a study that uh, 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 Shintan Parma did, so he's a postdoc in my group, where he looked at um, a training data set of a lung one data set of 310 samples with lung cancer, and then an internal valid of an external validation data set of 154 patients where we validated the results. So what we did is we had these two different data sets from different institutions, we did a feature extraction, and then we did a machine learning an analysis to, uh, to build the most optimal models in one in the discovery, and then went to the validation data set and uh, assessed its performance. So by doing so, we can get a really robust a sense of robust for different uh, methods. And what we found is that, so what you can see here in the bottom are the machine learning classification methods and, and, and uh, vertically are the, the feature selection methods. And what, is, what you can really see is that it really matters. You know? A lot of people just pick one machine learning method and one feature selection, one classification method, one feature selection method and report the results. But which one you pick can really make a large difference. You know, so, and also it is really dependent. You know, some feature selection methods really work well with, 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 uh, with some of the classification methods and, you know, and others work, uh, uh, work less. So we have to find this and we have to assess which, what combinations matter. And one thing that we, for example, always find is that random forest and support factor machines work very well. Uh, and also like um, MRMR, which is maximum redundancy, uh, maximum relevant minimum redundancy feature selection. Um, is really able to, to, to handle this redundant data that we have and it works very well. Uh, but also by doing such analyses, we can also look at stability versus classification. 
right? So if we have a data set and we take subsets of this data, we should have more or less the same model every time coming out of it, but also have it, that model should uh, have a very similar performance. So if you assess this and you know, we, can, we can assess all of these methods and see how the stability really matters, um, but also how then you know, the performance matters. And you, know, you can see here in these gray areas, these are methods that are very stable, one, and also have very uh, high, um, uh, and very, sorry, very similar predictive performance uh, for these classification methods. So um, what we can also do is a more statistical approach. We can look at an ANOVA, and then we can see, for example, what kind of factors really matter. And what you can see here is you know, the, 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 the y-axis are the, the variance, the percentage variance. So in this case, for example, the first bar, you can see that the classifier method is crucial. So which classifier methods you choose really matters for your subsequent results. But also, and for example, the feature selection method matters less. And also the size does not matter that much. So if you take 10, 10 features in one model or 20, more or less you get the same results. Um, so using these statistical methods, we really have to assess and really have to drill down what are the best features, but also what are the best methods to use in this. So what I want to show you now is um, some radiomics and imaging genomic studies. Uh, I want to just show you examples. I'll walk you through a couple of these to get an idea about what we're doing. So one study that we published in Nature Communications last year, two years ago actually, um, where we use this radiomics analysis from imaging, feature extraction, and then uh, the correlation, the analysis of this radiomics data with gene expression clinical data. So we performed this on 1,000 patients of lung and head and neck uh, cancer. So these were more advanced stages. These were treated radiotherapy, so it was not a diagnostic cohort. It was really a more advanced stage cohort. And what we, what we did is we developed a prognostic signature um, to see, you know, if, can we, using this data, predict if a patient's gonna uh, survive or not, right? So it's a very clinical question. But also, if we have developed this, can we then apply this into different, uh, across different cancer types? And by doing so, we can identify if there's a general phenotypic, um, uh, so general radiomic phenotype that is prognostic both in lung and head and neck cancer. Also, we had for uh, a subset of this data, we had uh, genomic data, uh, we can then assess how is this signature related with the underlying uh, gene expression patterns. So for training, we used a data set of 422 non-sponsored lung cancer patients um, that were treated at master clinic, so this is a clinic in the Netherlands. And what you can see here, so for people not really familiar looking at these heat maps, so what you can see here is that um, vertically you can see the radiomics features and horizontally the patients. And uh, you can see that there's groups of patients having more or less the same expression patterns, right? So that is a good thing, right? So there's, there's different clusters of patients having more or less the same phenotype. If you then, we did some quantity, uh, using the clustering, we did some um, assessment and we identified three different clusters. And if we then look at the differences between these different phenotypic uh, uh, groups, we find significant associations with, uh, for example, overall stage, but also in uh, histology. So, um, by doing so, we could really find an association between uh, um, the radiomics features and the, and the pathology. Um, but also, what I think is also important to mention is in the, in the vertical direction, you can see again that there's a lot of different features mo having more or less the same expression patterns for all the patients. So there's a lot of redundancy. If you take one of them, it's probably enough to capture that signal. So that is a general idea that is that what you have, is that we can reduce this, this space to say 20 or 30 most informative and most distinct uh, phenotypic traits. Um, and we see that this exists also in lung and in, uh, GBM cancer and brain cancer. So what we then did is a, a little bit of complicated analysis. I tried to walk you through it. But, so what we did is we had all of these features. Um, then we used uh, the test retest data sets, uh, as I explained before, to assess stability. So we get a stability rank for each of these features. So we know which features are stable and which ones are not. Then we also had a multiple delineation, so we had a data set with, uh, where five readers segmented the same tumor, and we can also, again, get a, a stability rank for this. And then uh, we had another training data set of 422 patients where we had also survival. So what we now did is we, we combined both. So we, we, uh, we selected features which were stable but also very informative for this prognostic model into um, a biomarker, so radiomic signature. And this signature, consists of four different features. So you had statistics energy, which is a very simple uh, measure, uh, shape compactness, so how compact the, the, the shape was, and then 
we had a grade level non-uniformity and a wavelet grade level non-uniformity. And these two, these two uh, features really drove that signal, the signature. So they were the main features in the signature. And what they really quantified is intertumor heterogeneity. So we, in a sense, had identified an intertumor heterogeneity signature um, in a lung cancer data set. What we then did, so this was all done in the discovery phase, then we went into the validation phase. And in the validation phase, we validated the signature, so only the signature traveled, so no, nothing else, the only signature was applied to different validation data set. Um, so one was the lung two data set, so it was from Rodbard University, it's another medical center in the Netherlands. Uh, and then we also, so to, to validate the lung cancer signature, you know, is it also perhaps, does it also have performance in this independent data set? And then, <clears throat> We validated this also in two different head and neck cancer data sets. And really to assess, you know, this signature that was trained in lung, does it also have significant performance in an independent data set of uh, head and neck cancer? Um, and then we had, an, so uh, these were the, the purple ones. And then we had another one, uh, the lung tree data set for 89 patients actually. We had radiomics data, gene expression data, uh, and we can see how is the signature, what are the underlying driving uh, pathways. So. Um, what we did is we, uh, so what you can see here is a couple of Meyer, you know, a lot of physicians like to see a couple of Meyer, so we show a couple of Meyer. But so what you can see here is that we did a median split of the signature in both data sets, and um, we had a concordance index, which is a, um, a generalization of the AUC for survival data. So what we can see there is that the prognostic performance in an independent validation data set had a strong performance, a gold index of 65, in this independent data set of 225 patients. Then we took the signature and applied it to the head and neck cancer cohort, and the performance was even better. So we are around 70 in two independent data sets. Um, uh, we, we, the prognostic performance was around 70. So this really means that if you have a lung cancer signature, which was derived, this prognostic signature, this intertumor heterogeneity signature, could be applied across different cancer types and have a strong performance uh, in independent validation data sets. Um, we also did some validation to see, you know, it's so performed significantly better to volume in all data sets, um, which is always a baseline, right? If volume also does the same thing, why would we even do radiomics? Um, but also we saw that the signature performance was uh, significantly better in TNM staging in two of the three data sets, but it always complements. So this means that if you have TNM staging and you add a radiomic signature and you build a new model, it always has a better performance and uh, the performance increases. So it's really complementary information in radiomics and in independent validation data sets compared to standard uh, clinical data. So this is something that we did two years ago. And we published the results and we put some of the data public uh, the majority of data actually. But what we then did is we had that signature and then we went to another data set, we went to Toronto, and we looked at the Princess Market and we uh, assessed in over 500 patients with head and neck cancer, we assessed the prognostic performance as well. And so um, literally a student, so Ralph Leiner, so he was a PhD student, he went with his computer to Toronto and he installed there uh, the, the software to extract only that signature and then ex uh, and to validate it. So. What we found is, is that um, the signature had a significant performance in all of the uh, validation data sets. Um, and even if you take the, the total data set, just how, you know, all the data that was there, we applied the signature, it had a significant performance, better also than volume. And then even there was a lot of artifacts, right? Because had a neck cancer patients, they have a lot of artifacts uh, in CT scans. If you remove the artifacts, you saw even that uh, the patients with artifacts, you could even see that the performance was uh, increased a little bit. So this really shows that you know, using a robust method to develop a signature uh, also um, um, not ensures, but you have a higher, more higher likelihood the signature can be applied in the future and has also still a significant performance. All right, so what we then did is we wanted to look, assess how is the signature correlated with the underdriving, underlying biology? So what is the driving biology? So what we took is we, we assessed these four different features that were in the signature, and uh, we performed a gene set enrichment analysis, which is a, um, um, an analysis developed by the Broad Institute at Boston, where they, um, they, they look at how different, at a pathway level, how is the signature correlated with the gene set expression on a pathway level. And what we found, so significant associations, is that uh, statistics total energy and shape compactness were very uh, highly correlated with tissue uh, development data as gene sets. But most importantly, the gray level non-uniformity and the wavelet the non-uniformity, so really the drivers of the signature, were very strongly associated with cell cycling and proliferation. So what we found there is that if you have a CT scan that is more or less homogeneous, it's, or heterogeneous, for example, there's 
um, very likely it's going to be an upregulation of cell cycle and proliferation in that tumor. If it's a more homogeneous tumor, it's also very likely it's going to be um, a downregulation of these pathways. And that is by far the strongest signals that we, uh, the strongest associations that we always find in these data set. So building on this, um, we did another analysis, um, and uh, Patrick Grossman, so he's a bio, uh, biostatistician in my group. So he did an analysis, an, an imaging genomic analysis in lung cancer. And what he tried to do is he tried to discover the unique connections between radiomics data and molecular pathways and clinical outcomes. Uh, but also, he tried to see, can we use this radiomics to predict the state of a pathway? You know, if the feature can be predict if a gene set is up or down, right? This can be very informative also for the clinic. Um, but also, if you have radiomics data and you have genomic data, by combining different d um, uh, data sources, can we then be get better prognostic signatures, right? So is there complementary information in each of these data, set, data types that we can use? So we had two different data sets. Um, a discovery cohort for patients that were treated with surgery uh, at the Moffitt Cancer Center, where we had imaging, gene expression data, and clinical outcome data. And then we also had an independent validation data set from the Netherlands, uh, where we had 89 patients that um, were also treated with surgery. We also had imaging, gene expression data, and clinical outcome data. So this was a prospectively collected um, uh, data set where the samples were sent from the Netherlands to the Moffitt and were, uh, were, um, um, were run through the race there to assess the gene expression data. So the workflow is very similar to what we um, what we had before, so we have imaging data, we have a segmentation, we, um, we have a feature extraction, and then we have a da data integration part, right? So what he did is he took the discovery cohort, so data set one, he, we had for 262 patients, we had radiomics data and genomics data. Then we performed, um, um, we performed a gene set enrichment analysis to look at um, the domain associations between the different radiomics features and the different pathway expression values. Then we use a novel approach in bioinformatics, you know, your bi-clustering approach that's assessed what is the main associations. So what are the main associations between radiomics features and underlying gene expression data? And we had a very robust um, method to assess this. Um, and so, so, and so we have these modules which consist of radiomics features, so groups of radiomics features and groups of pathways. And if you have these modules, how is this done back related to clinical outcome data, which we have for, for the majority of patients? And then also we could perform a meta-analysis. So what we now did is we had a, a complex bi um, um, bioinformatics assessment in the, in the training data, the discovery data. But the nice thing is we also had an independent validation data set where we could validate each of these different steps and see if it was really significant. Um, so what he identified is he identified 13 main modules um, of um, independent, so 13 main modules that were identified but also independently validated. So we wanted to see is this association also significant in the validation data set? And he found this. Um, and we found that these radiomics modules are really associated with distinct biological processes. So there were one, you know, groups of radiomics features, so one phenotype was associated with, you know, with a, with a, with a distinct biological process, you know, other phenotypes were associated with other phenotypic proce uh, genotypic processes. Like, you know, TGF-beta, immune system P53, circadian clocks, all very important uh, uh, processes in cancer. Uh, but also, we found that these modules were significantly associated with several clinical parameters. So we found that some of these modules were associated with survival, other ones weren't. Uh, some with histology, for example, a lot of them were associated with stage. So we see there's a big stage effect. If you're early stage or later stage, there's different biology, but also for different phenotypes. So looking, for example, at um, module 13, so this was um, from the mitochondria um, um, module, which was significantly associated with the Laplacian of Gaussian. So we've found a very core, so this is an, the entropy feature of Laplacian of Gaussian, so this uh, radiomics feature. Um, and if you, another, um, and as an example, another uh, module, number six, had a very strong correlation between wavelet textual features and circadian clock. So, and these are very distinct biological patterns, but also um, in phenotypic, uh, radiomics patterns. So we can really see different patterns here. Um, one thing that was also very important is actually maybe the most important result. Um, we had, number two, we had an immune system P53, where we uh, found, um, so we found different biological processes were associated with the immune system P53 in this module. 
but also if we try to use a radiomics uh, feature to predict the activation of this, uh, of this pathway, we found a very um, uh, high and significant correlation in an independent validation set, right? So we, we trained something, we find an association in the discovery data set, then we went to the validation and we found a significant association. So really you can see again the assessment between pathways, the driving pathways, drive a different phenotype, and how is this then associated with the clinical outcome. What we then did is we assessed, you know, if we have this clinical, if you have clinical information, if we have radiomics data and genomics data, if we combine these data types, do we get better uh, prognostic signatures? So what we did is we took two signatures, so one genomic signature that was, uh, that was built in 2010, not by us, but by others, we took that signature um, and applied it to the gene expression data. Then we had another signature that was not seen by this data, um, where we, uh, for our signature from, from, the, from the Nature Common 2014, and we took this prognostic radiomic signature. And then we, you know, if you look at the, the prognostic performance, which is shown in the bars, you can see that the clinical data, um, the clinical signature using stage, gender, age, um, and histology, I think, uh, had, a, had a very strong performance. So, you know, clinical data matters, of course. We know this, right? Uh, the genomic signature, the performance itself, was not that high, was not significant, and the radiomic signature had a, had a decent performance in this data set, which is also significant. But the most important thing is, is that if you start combining different data types, you can really see that this performance in this independent data set, independent validation data set, really goes up. So this really shows that there's complementary information in radiomics data, genomics data, and clinical data. And if by combining these different data types, you get always to the best results, the best prognostic signature. And also we had to, you know, to ensure the, the results were stable. We also used some other signatures and we always see the same trend. The, always the highest, or the, in this case, the, the, the pink bar was always the highest when we combined all the different data types. All right, so um, something similar uh, has been done by the Geiger Lab in, in the University of Chicago where they uh, assess also, and this was published in Nature, uh, scientific reports in uh, 2015, um, and what they, what they did is they also did a very similar analysis, and they found also very strong associations between the radiomics phenotype data and the clinical outcome data. Uh, but also, they found uh, that these different radiomics features were also significantly associated with very important uh, pathways like cell cycling and DNA replication. Um, so again, they, and this was in a breast cancer MRI, so they really showed again, you know, very similar that, is, you know, that there's a driving biological pattern that drives a phenotype and that is also associated with, uh, with the outcomes. Um, looking at GBM, for example, so brain cancer, you can already see that there's a lot of different phenotypic traits, right? So you can see that there's some tumors that have um, a more higher necrotic uh, area, other ones have a, um, um, uh, have a small, other ones have a large necrotic area. Some have a high contrast enhancing, other ones have a low contrast enhancing. Some have a very large edema, some have a very small edema. So there are very, a large number of phenotypic traits that exist on these MRI scans. And if we, um, so we contoured uh, these uh, using, so uh, all of these volumes were contoured uh, on these scans and were reviewed by neuroradiologists. Uh, and if you look at these, the values, so the prognostic value, you know, you can see that different volumes matter, right? So if you have a necrotic area, this really matters for prognosis, of course. You know, if it's larger, it's a bad survival. If it's, uh, if it's uh, smaller, it's, it's a good survival. But also other things like the edema did not matter. So the volume of the edema, which was very surprising to us, did not contain any prognostic information. Um, so what we then did is we also compared very similarly. We looked at these different, uh, these volumetric measures uh, and we looked at the different pathways that were associated with, and we found that these, the volumetric composition of a GBM, GBM tumor uh, was very important and was driven by different biological pathways, um, like immune response, inflammation, um, and cell cycling, for example. What we then also did is, because we also had sequencing data for these, so we had mutational data, um, we looked how is, for example, a P53 mutated tumor, so you know, a, a mutation, in, uh, in, a driver mutation, how is this reflected in gene expression data, but also how is this reflected in the phenotype? And we found, for example, very significant correlations. Um, for example, the P53 mutation tumor had significantly smaller uh, contrast enhancing and necrotic volumes, um, and they were um, uh, compared to wild type, for example. Um, so what we also did is we assessed in, uh, in, in 76 patients how is then 
uh, could we use this radiomics data to predict if a mutation occurred, right? So if we would, we could have a non-invasive predictive mutational status, which is a challenging thing, but we found significant correlations here with a strong performance with that different foliometric compositions could predict uh, different, uh, mutation, with different mutations. So, for example, the contrasting enhancing volume or the necrotic volume could really predict a P53 mutation, but an, uh, vice versa, um, a nec necrosis divided by contrast enhancing ratio had a very strong performance to predict, for example, for the EGFR. So there is a different composition that has a different mutational uh, buildup and also predictability. All right, I have a, two more minutes. So current status of a radiomics. So we really see that imaging moves more and more towards a data science, so to, towards a data, a computational data science. So it has a lot of similarities with bioinformatics. And we can learn a lot from the bioinformatics community, like sharing code, sharing data, which is very uncommon in the, radio, in the radiology field. But that is something that we, uh, I think we have to really we have to do. Um, but also we have seen that due to advances in imaging over the last couple of decades, we can already look at the data that was generated a couple of years ago in the clinics, and we can extract information from these images that are informative, that are more informative than, for example, volume of maximum diameter. So there's a huge, large retrospective and perspective potential, right? So we can go back, we can mine all these uh, PAC systems, but also for moving forward, you know, by better standardization of technique, these techniques, we'll probably the data would only uh, increase the quality of the data. So we see that a large number of imaging features were defined and were success successfully implemented. Um, so we did it in 3D Slicer and Python, and we'll, you know, we'll share this toolbox soon. Um, we also found that you know, radiomic signatures were prognostic across cancer types. So we, you know, we found significant associations with different clinical outcomes. Uh, we also found a strong connection with the genomic patterns. So there's a different biological patterns that drive distinct phenotypes. Um, but also we, need, we see that integration from multiple data sets is important, but also of different data types. So you know, integrating genomic and radiomics data is really important. Um, of course, there's a lot of challenges, right? So we, you know, we have to further optimize imaging quality. We have to further look in segmentations, you know, like they have to be accurate, robust, uh, stable, uh, fast. Um, we have to look at feature algorithms. Uh, you know, these have to have the highest performance and the highest stability. You know, how do we, you know, drill down to these? But also, we have to see what is the exact role in precision medicine, right? So, you know, how do we really improve a prognostic and diagnostic and prognostic and predictive power? How do we get these signatures into the clinic? Um, we also, the downside for this data set, we require large data sets for discovery and validation. So, you know, this takes a lot of time to, gener to, to collect these and to generate these and to curate these. But also one challenge is that it's very multidisciplinary. So we need clinicians to give us, you know, to, to ground us to the clinical problem. We need imaging physics people that can really make sure, you know, that the imaging quality is, 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 um, is high and also the features that are calculated are, uh, uh, are high. We need data scientists to really you know, analyze this data correctly. So there's a very multidisciplinary and it requires a lot of people uh, to do so. Um, there is also informatic challenges, right? So we, you know, we see that a lot of technical developments now are very isolated. You know, so a lot of people have their own radiomics tool set and small data sets and they validate it or larger data sets, but it's not used, the same code is not used by others. Um, a lot of these features are not standardized. So, you know, what I call a Laplacian of Gauss, uh, Laplacian of Gaussian entropy uh, feature can be completely different from the um, implementation of the algorithm of somebody else, still calling it the same name. So it's important. But also we see that a lot of analysis are very focused. So they focus on only GBM for this specific purpose. But a lot of these methods could be applied more widely and more broadly across cancer types. So there's a lot of challenges. And the NCI asked me to uh, advertise um, some of their initiatives that they have in this area. So there's several uh, very large um, uh, U1, R1, U24, so large uh, uh, funding opportunities from the NCI that are currently looking for proposals that uh, want to address these challenges. Um, so one thing I'm going to focus here on is uh, so the quantitative imaging network. So this is a large uh, imaging network within the US uh, with a lot of ca different cancer centers. Uh, so they are uh, now expanding to outside the US. So it's uh, more getting more global. Um, so that is more the quantitative imaging. So driving more quantitative imaging to more quantitative data. Uh, and there's also an ITCR, which is the informatics technology for cancer research. And these are U24s and U1s. Uh, and they really focus on the informatics part of this. And 
if you look, they have, what I really like about this, this program is that they have like different levels. So they have from, you know, a very basic algorithm development. So you have an idea, you have an algorithm, a small data set, you just want to validate this. Um, they all the way going down, you know, like so to earlier stages, which, you know, gets uh, funding gets, gets way larger and then to advanced stage, which is uh, uh, 600,000 direct costs per year for five years. So these are large uh, grants to even uh, sustainment. So if you have a project that focuses on this, you know, in whatever stage it is, there's mostly uh, um, one of the initiatives that will fit to it. So please ask me if you have any questions or ask uh, Dr. Clark from the NCI if you have any questions about it. Um, so we have one uh, U24 that focuses on a radiomics platform. So we're building an open source radiomics platform for data analysis. It was built on a lot of open source tools like 3D Slicer, ITK, uh, ITK Python, R. Um, where we really want to, you know, assess the data and analysis and build a system and share it also to the public. All right, one more minute. So one take home message I want to do, and I, th I really want to stress this every time I have the chance to stress this, um, is that we have to do better. So we is the radiomics and imaging, commu uh, imaging genomics community. Um, we have to do a better job because there's too many mistakes are made. So half of the papers I read now currently in this domain are wrong. So they have small mistakes, but a lot of them have very large mistakes. And examples include that they uh, didn't have independent validation data. There was information leakage from the training to validation data, data set. Um, so for example, you train and validate on the same data and then you, know, you have discovered this awesome biomarker that is completely overfitted. Um, but also, um, there's no correction of multiple testing. So you have one data set, you test a huge number of, of different hypotheses and you find one that is significant and there's no correction or the wrong correction. Um, so, you know, there's very subtle mistakes that can be made and really small details matter. So I think, you know, for all of these analysis, if you're interested, get biostatisticians involved. They will ensure that, you know, each of these steps are correct. Um, so they, they play a crucial role in this whole process. And, I was thinking about this when I read this paper, um, which I like to refer to as forensic radiology. So what they did is, and this is a great study done from uh, King's College in London. So what they did is they, they looked at the false discovery rate. So they, they, they looked at different studies and PET and CT, say radiomic studies, and just looking at uh, the material methods and at the paper, so they didn't have access to the code, they didn't have access to the, to the data, but just looking at the, 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 the manuscript, they wanted to see, you know, did they do a good job? And from the 20 different papers that they assessed, and I mask out the names because I don't want to bash anybody that is working on this, but they had 20 different studies, uh, and all of them, you know, the p-value should be below the red bar, and all of them in a right corrected manner was much higher. So this means that even if you publish a paper, it's out there, right? And the, a lot of reviewers don't know. They don't know if this was the right statistical approach. They don't know if this was the right approach. But even after the fact, there are now groups of people that want to assess you, that want to go back to your studies and want to see, you know, did they do a good job? So that's my only, you know, be cautious. You know, these guys are out there to hunt you down, right? So, <laughs> all right. So I want to thank the people from my lab, from Dana-Faber, from Brigham, and also from Mastro in the Netherlands. Um, and of course, I want to thank the NCI. Thank you.